Jacques Vallée still doesn't know what UFOs are. After six globetrotting decades spent probing the phenomenon, the French information scientist is sure of only one thing, the truth is really, really out there. On a white restaurant tablecloth in San Francisco, under the glow of a stained glass dome ceiling with images of laurels, fleur-de-lis, and a ship, rested a portion of metal the size of a shallot. Around it, three men were having lunch one day in the summer of 2018. Jacques Vallée, a French information scientist, was explaining to Max Platzer, editor of a top aeronautics journal, how the metal had come into his possession. The story wound back more than four decades, he said serenely, to an unexplained episode in Council Bluffs, Iowa. On a cold Saturday night in late 1977, firefighters and police had responded to calls about a roundish, reddish object with blinking lights that hovered above the treetops in a public park, then dumped a bright mass onto the ground. When investigators arrived on the scene, they found a four-by-six-foot puddle of metal, molten-like lava, that lit the surrounding grass on fire before cooling. All told, 11 people from four separate groups gave similar accounts of the incident. Could a hoaxer have poured the metal in place? Unlikely, Valet said. That would have required an industrial furnace, plus some way of transporting the molten material. A canvassing of the local metal businesses had turned up nothing. Thermite was a possibility, it burns hot enough to melt steel and wouldn't produce a crater. But to create the cast iron-like material that Platzer saw before him, the perpetrator would have had to douse the puddle in water, and the water would have frozen, and there was no ice on the scene. Valet thought the metal deserved a look with the latest technology. This was where the third man at the table came in. Gary Nolan, now eating a burger, was a pathology professor at Stanford University School of Medicine. His specialty was analyzing cells, especially cancer and immune cells, but some of his techniques worked on inorganic matter too. His equipment could, for instance, parse a metal sample at the atomic level, telling you not only which elements it contained but also which variants, or isotopes, of those elements, and where inside the sample they occurred. This, in turn, could offer clues as to where the material was manufactured, on Earth, elsewhere, and possibly even its purpose. A piece of this puddle was now sitting a few inches from Platzer's plate. The mystery, Valet said, was where the material had come from originally. Metallurgical analyses at the time showed that it consisted mostly of iron, with traces of carbon, titanium, and other elements, basically, steel alloys scrambled to what looked like cast iron. It couldn't be satellite debris or equipment falling from a plane, Valet pointed out, those wouldn't have gotten hot enough to melt, and they would have cratered the ground. Nor, for the same reasons, could it be a meteorite. And there wasn't enough nickel for a meteorite anyway. Platzer was not the sort you'd expect to attend a lunch about UFOs. He made his bones working on the Saturn V rocket, the launch vehicle that conveyed humans to the moon, and he taught for three decades at the Naval Postgraduate School. But he had made inquiries into these two men. Nolan's reputation was impeccable, he told me later, and Valet's was outstanding. Valet, who is 82 now, has celestite eyes, a strong nose, and a head of sterling hair that seems to riff on tinfoil hats. Beneath the rare hair is a rarer mind. His recollections from a six-decade career as a scientist and technologist include helping NASA map Mars, creating the first electronic database for heart transplant patients, working on ARPANET, the Internet's ancestor, developing networking software that was adopted by the British Library, the U.S. National Security Agency, and 72 nuclear power plants around the world, and guiding more than $100 million in high-tech investment as a venture capitalist. Contacts from Valet's long-term Rolodex praise his seriousness, Federico Fagin, inventor of Intel's first commercial microprocessor, and no BS level-headedness, Paul Sappho, tech forecaster, they emphasize that he keeps balance, Ian Sobieski, chair of the investment group Band of Angels, and is not a showboat, au contraire. Paul Gomery, executive headhunter, they assure you that he is very careful, Peter Sturrock, plasma physicist, and wants concreteness, Vint Cerf, Internet Hall of Famer and Google VP. Yet beneath that sober exterior, they may also say, beats the heart of a poet, 
Sappho again. Valet has written twelve books on what he and others call the phenomenon, the range of surreal experiences that include UFO encounters. He considers the work a hobby and shrinks from the pseudo-archaeologists, credentialed grifters, and conspiracy brothers who tend to populate the field. There are beaucoup de bozos in this clown car, and Valet is a cautious driver. As he sees it, the phenomenon represents both a scientific and a social frontier. When you study it, you must harness numbers, databases, pattern hunting algorithms, but you must also have an ethnographic streak, an interest in how culture molds understanding. You have to endeavor, in other words, to weigh both hard and soft data, despite the modern scenario where the physics department is at one end of the campus and the psychology department at the other end. Valet's papers, entrusted to Rice University, will ultimately include files on some 500 anomalous events that he has personally investigated, from the abduction of Betty and Barney Hill on U.S. Route 3 to a landing that paralyzed a farmer in a Provencal lavender crop. Yet he likes to joke that he is the only ufologist who does not know what UFOs are. He doubts that they are interstellar SUVs, would be disappointed if they were. The truth, he believes, is almost surely freakier than that, more baffling, and more revealing of the nature of the universe. This is why, long ago, when Steven Spielberg consulted him for Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Valet pushed against the final scene, in which the aliens emerge from their spaceship. Too prescriptive, he thought. Spielberg memorialized Valet as the film's French scientist character, played by François Truffaut, but he went with the meet and greet ending. It appears to have been what the public wanted, Close Encounters beat out Star Wars at the box office just days after the Council Bluffs incident. Platzer considered himself neutral on the subject of UFOs. One has to be very careful in saying that certain things are impossible, because they became possible, he told me. Think of, you know, the airplane. Reputable science journals like his had always avoided the subject, in a tacit, shared embargo that extends to subjects like the Flat Earth Doctrine. But Platzer felt that solid experimentation was in order. He agreed to publish Nolan and Valet's research if it passed peer review. It's time, he said. Valet's arrival on Earth, in 1939, coincided with a flash, Nazi bombs falling on the suburbs of Paris. His mother was a space exploration enthusiast. His father was a criminal court judge, used to human testimony in all its colors. Valet was never bored as a child. He collected telescopes and gazed at the moon and Jupiter. In 1954, during a three-month wave of flying saucer sightings in France and Italy, he clipped all the stories with witness interviews and pasted them into a notebook for re-reading. The following spring, when Valet was 15 years old, he met the phenomenon on a clear, windless Sunday. He was up in the attic helping his dad with some woodworking while his mom was gardening outside. She screamed, he raced downstairs. He saw a grey disc silently parked above the town's gothic cathedral. Valet's best friend watched it from higher ground through binoculars. We were the perfect little nerds. He told me. I got him to draw it. It was the same thing. Valet's dad was sure the boys and his wife had seen a military prototype an explanation his son almost swallowed. Perfect little French nerds weren't, of course, the only types applying themselves to the UFO question in the 50s. In the US, the Air Force had set up a public study called Project Blue Book. In Switzerland, the psychiatrist Carl Jung was finding himself puzzled to death by flying saucers. In his book on the subject, he likened UFOs to a technological angel or a physicist's miracle. They were shaped like mandolas, he wrote, and seemed to have a similar effect on our psyche, a symbol of wholeness that appears in situations of psychic confusion and perplexity. Valet went to the Sorbonne to study math. One day, in a Paris department store, he picked up a book called Mysterio Objet Celeste, by the philosopher Aimé Michel. In ufology at the time, the Vogue was for non-fiction that borrowed from pulp's plots about civilizations on Venus and Mars, Against it, Celeste put forward the field's first testable hypothesis. According to Michel, if you charted all those 1954 sightings on a map, you'd find that they made straight lines crisscrossing the country. He called the pattern orthotony. 
Valet, thrilled to see a proper theory, sent the author a letter. The teenager questioned whether humans could communicate with these hidden intelligences, which Michel had termed X. In his reply, Michel said that he did not have much hope of that. He reminded Valet that witnesses had seen craft appear out of thin air and shapeshift in split seconds. How could one make sense of visions like that? Don't be fooled by the idea of getting to the bottom of things, he urged. That's only a mirage. Valet should instead cultivate his mind as if it were a flower, though he should also remember that the poppy is a flower and not get lost in any intoxicating notions. The advice landed. Valet began writing a novel called Le Sub Espace, about a team of scientists who flee a world war on Earth, get set up in a lab on the dark side of the moon, and build a machine that allows them to explore alternate realities while dodging hallucinatory traps. He published the book under a pseudonym and, under his own name, worked toward a master's in astrophysics. And he married Janine Saley, a like-minded soul who had trained to be a child psychologist but later switched to IT. She had moved into the student housing next to his, and through the thin wall they realized that they loved the same records. The year Valet graduated, Le Sub Espace won the Jules Verne Prize. Despite the honor, awarded at the Eiffel Tower, he kept his sci-fi interests semi-secret. He worked as an astronomer for the French government, based out of a chateau-turned observatory near the capital, where a whining IBM 650 computed the orbits of satellites out in stables once used by the king's mistress. Then, in 1962, Valet took another astronomy job, this time in Austin, Texas. He appreciated the big oaks, big butterflies, and big cars and learned, he says, that a good scientist is like a rider on the rodeo circuit, with the nerve to re-embark on the bull. He has signed off emails to me hook him up, etc., but he was also feeling ready to chuck a perfectly fine career in astronomy for what he expected would be a more interesting life in computers and mysterious celestial objects. The following year offered the perfect opportunity, J. Allen Hynek, the chair of Northwestern University's astronomy department, found him a job programming for the school's technological institute. Hynek was also the scientific advisor on Project Blue Book, the U.S. Air Force's UFO probe. Valet, barely 24, with a helmet of brunette hair, would serve as Hynek's unofficial aide-de-camp. There are in France more real philosophers than in any country on earth, but there are also a great proportion of pseudo-philosophers there, Thomas Jefferson wrote in a letter to a friend in 1803. A ghoul's exuberant imagination often creates facts for him, the president and gentleman scientist went on, and he tells them with good faith. Earlier that year, the French Minister of the Interior had sent Jean-Baptiste Biot, a young physicist, to investigate reports of a fireball and a hail of rubble over the town of Laidler, in Normandy. The Academy of Science was split over how to explain this phenomenon, did the stones, as Descartes believed, originate in the atmosphere? Were they, as others thought, disgorged by volcanoes or zapped from the ground by lightning strikes? Or were the stones, perhaps, strangers to our planet? B.O. was among a growing fringe that pushed the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Unusually for the time, he traveled to the area to collect his own data. Even more unusually, he spoke to regular folks, citizens, in the French Revolutionary Argo, about what they had seen. B.O. categorized the evidence he collected as either physical, stones, craters, or moral, people's testimony. In Chicago, Valet's new mentor, Heineck, wanted a UFO event like Laidler. He wanted unimpeachable photography or something he could hold in his hands. In meetings of the Invisible College, the discreet ufology club the Valleys hosted at their apartment, he would say, we have to wait for a really good case to show up. But Valet argued that scientific discoveries don't usually happen that way, understanding tends to come into view slowly, he said, after methodical study they shouldn't wait around for some sensational event that might never happen. They should be gathering every scrap of available UFO data, hard and soft, and truffling out the patterns in it. Solving for that unknown X. Around the time the valley's first child, a son, was born, the couple compiled a digital database of what they deemed credible UFO observations, 
it was populated with hundreds of reports from Project Blue Book in the US and thousands more they collected from Europe. Valet was among the first to bring computers, statistics, and simulations to bear on the phenomenon. One of the things these tools taught him was that orthotony, the pattern Michelle discovered, occurred purely by chance. Valet spent 1964 pushing his son's stroller along Lake Michigan, programming a model of the cardiovascular system for Northwestern's medical school, pursuing a PhD focused on artificial intelligence, and polishing his first UFO tome, Anatomy of a Phenomenon, in which he argued that witnesses were a rich trove of data and should be taken seriously by scientists. He eventually designed a classification system that accounted for how credible the source was, whether the site had been examined by investigators, and what possible explanations for the incident might be, but Valet was wary of coming off as some loud and proud missionary, he did not allow his publisher to mention on the dust jacket that he worked for Northwestern, and he refused to aggressively promote the book. Valet recalls that Carl Sagan wrote to him admiringly about anatomy, but balked when the ufologist asked whether he could extract a book blurb from the letter. As one UFO-friendly physicist told me, you have to pay attention to your political situation as a scientist. In 1966, under pressure from Congress, the Air Force convened a panel of civilian scientists to decide whether the UFO question warranted further research. The committee was led by Edward Condon, an esteemed nuclear and quantum physicist. As Valet recalls it, he and Hynek were the first to testify. Afterward, Valet watched Condon nap through Hynek's press conference, after 18 months and 59 cases sussed, the Condon committee concluded that study probably cannot be justified in the expectation that science will be advanced. Its opinion was endorsed by the National Academy of Sciences and published as a 965-page mass-market paperback with a foreword by the science editor of the New York Times. Long before that book was printed, the Valley split for Paris in disgust. Valet resides in San Francisco but keeps a pied at Terry in the saint germain de prés quarter of the French capital. On one of the afternoons I spent there with him, over coffee and eclairs, he showed me a lithograph of a 16th-century engraving, which he'd spotted in the window of a nearby cellar and had to have. It depicted an encounter, around 800 years earlier, between Street Francis and a heavenly seraph. Francis was filled with both joy and pain by the experience. In the engraver's interpretation, the angel emits a beam of light that brands him with stigmata. Those details remind Valet of a wave of UFO activity in Brazil in 1977, shortly before the Council Bluffs incident. Victims reported being hit by powerful light beams from boxy craft. Dozens of them, he says, had burns consistent with exposure to radiation. We were in the same part of town that his family had moved to in 1967, when Valet took a job at Shell. On computers in a basement off the Champs-Élysées, he had built balletic databases that anticipated how much and what kind of gas the French would guzzle in cars, trucks, boats, and trains as they set upon the Côte d'Azur for holidays. That spring, a civil unrest swept France and much of the population went on a general strike, his second child, a daughter, was born. There was chaos, and clarity. The Condon report had exposed how the UFO question tended to alternate between two poles, either you believed that these phenomena were mirages created by bizarre natural events or tricks of human perception, all lightning, weather balloons, or you believed that UFOs were nuts and bolts ships piloted by extraterrestrial starfarers. Valet found himself in neither camp. His young accented sense of the phenomenon told him it was more than nuts and bolts. Something about it spoke to people on the level of mythology, engaged their psyches. Reports of sixth sense experiences, like clairvoyance, were the norm. He hoped that science would eventually begin to explain all this, would explain what kind of technology, from what place, could generate such physical, mental, even spiritual effects. A 3D hologram with mass. A 5D object going through our 4D universe? the psychic equivalent of a film projector, capable of showing one person Bambi and another Godzilla? Whatever the technology was, Valet believed that humans had been reckoning with it for millennia, as both empirical fact and quavering myth. And he began collecting the cultural references to prove it. With the help of Paris booksellers, 
he acquired a library of esoteric texts and created a catalog of UFO sightings reaching back to pre-modern times. This catalog ran longer than the 1969 book he wrote based on it, Passport to Magonia. In Japan, Valet found, an earthenware vessel cut a luminous trail over the countryside in 1180, and samurai observed a red wheel in 1606. The Romans had seen shields in the sky, the Native Americans' baskets from heaven. In the 1760s, at the age of 16, Goethe was on the road to college when he encountered innumerable little lights that beamed on in a ravine. Maybe it was will-o'-the-wisps, the budding polymath said. I will not decide. The beings that Valet wrote about would trick you. They would steal you and return you after a while, hours or generations later. If they spoke, what they said was bonkers, that they came from Kansas, or from anywhere, but will be in Greece day after tomorrow, which is what an airship denizen told a bystander in 1897. Later, we are from what you people refer to as planet Mars. When you looked at these cases in aggregate, there was sameness to the strangeness. In 1961, for example, the occupants of a silvery UFO, who wore turtlenecks, signaled a Wisconsin plumber to fill their jug with water. He thought they seemed to be Italian-looking. He granted the request, and they repaid his kindness with a plate of pancakes that tasted like cardboard. The pancakes were unsalted, according to a subsequent analysis by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. This exchange, Valet pointed out, echoed stories from before the Industrial Revolution about elves offering buckwheat cakes to Breton. And those little people were known not to stomach salt, either. Could it be, Valet asked, that whatever was behind the fairy faith was behind ufology? Couldn't they come from the same deep stream, filtered through changing cultural and technological milieus? After Magonia came out, the valleys moved a couple of times, eventually settling in San Francisco for the weird seventies. He went to work for SRI International, where he helped Doug Engelbart, the inventor of the mouse, get ARPANET going. In that era, many of Valet's colleagues were into Erhard Seminar's training, EST, a cultish self-help enterprise. He felt enormous pressure from all the groupies to participate but didn't. Out of caution, Valet says, he has never used tobacco or drugs and rarely drinks alcohol, he left SRI to work at the Institute for the Future, where he led teams that developed some of the earliest social networks. In his free time, Valet ran computer analyzes on historical UFO records. He discovered startling patterns of activity, which a psychological anthropologist at UCLA told him looked like a reinforcement schedule, the same process you might use to teach Spot or Rover a new trick. In Valet's 1975 book, Invisible College, he hypothesized that the phenomenon is a control system, pulling on the delicate levers of the human imagination, reprogramming our software, in effect. To what end? Valet couldn't say, any more than he could tell you the sound of one hand clapping. In his view, absurdity is an essential feature of the phenomenon. It fatigues the rational mind because the rational mind cannot ken it. As he put it to me recently, sometimes the phenomenon behaves like a dolphin, it plays with us. It's a lot smarter than we are, and it uses humor at another level, he said. Valet's next career move was into venture capitalism, a métier that, like ufology, affords great opportunities to lose your good name, your shirt, and your shit. He earned a reputation for diplomacy and decency. He began penning a weekly column for Le Figaro's economy desk, translating Silicon Valley's mania into terms a hidebound French audience could understand. Strong Alexis de Tocqueville vibes, by the mid-aughts, he was running a $75 million seed fund for NASA. I asked whether his preoccupation with UFOs ever raised eyebrows. Valet smiled. People don't give you that kind of money if they suspect there's something wrong with you, he said. Years before the lunch with Max Platzer, Valet and Gary Nolan were members together of a secret club of ufologists, similar to the old Invisible College. I will call them the Lone Stars, because the members I spoke with asked me not to publish the group's real name. Now disbanded, they were a tight circle of serious scientists, plus one European royal, who would convene a few times a year to discuss their research. According to Nolan, 
former Lone Stars are one step away from all the big UFO news of the past several years, the aerial sightings by Navy pilots, the inconclusive Pentagon report that made the front page of the Times as U.S. concedes it can't identify flying objects. Nolan showed me his certificate of induction into the group, a piece of valiant drollery embossed with big-eyed bald-headed aliens. Where Valet reacts to most criticism with La and keeps his head down, Nolan is disputatious. He came out as gay at the age of 20, at the start of the AIDS epidemic, and does not suffer closets. I had one of the heads of the National Cancer Institute, at a bar at a conference, come up to me and say, Gary, you know you're going to ruin your career with this stuff, Nolan told me. And I just went after him. I said, what scientist takes something off the table? After the meeting with Platza, it took Valet and Nolan three years to get the Council Bluff study finished, written up, edited, and ready for peer review. While that was happening, Valet turned his attention to another old case, one that many UFOers regard as a nothing burger, if not a sham. In 1945, one month after the very first nuclear weapon test, codenamed Trinity, two kid cowboys in the New Mexican desert, aged seven and nine, heard a crash. They found an avocado-shaped craft, inside of which were mantis-like occupants. The beings seemed to be in pain, which made the younger boy cry. The two witnesses went decades without speaking of what went down. One metal artifact, still under analysis, remains from the site. Last year, Valet self-published a book about the case, co-authored with Paola Harris, an Italian ufological journalist who once taught at the American Overseas School of Rome and currently teaches at a Hawaii-based non-profit that supports alien contactees, government whistleblowers, and the cause of galactic diplomacy. His decision to partner with her rankled the UFO community. Why? Some asked, would this no-nonsense scully saddle up with a woo-woo Mulder? Evidently, they have forgotten about the fruits that a dynamic can bear, the book suffers from a need for professional editing, but it is classic valet, marching confidently into the shifting borderland between fringe and mainstream. In the end, the reader must decide whether to believe in the phenomenon or not. And the shallot-sized lump of metal from Council Bluffs. It was made of isotopically ordinary elements, atypically mixed together. The Progress in Aerospace Sciences paper, which was published in December 2021, was never meant to be a breakthrough about what UFOs are, Valet told me. It wasn't meant, laidless style, to pummel an entire town with rocks. It is a template, he said, for what serious UFO research could be in the future, if one plays by the rules. He and Nolan are now studying samples for potential follow-up papers. You have to open the door first, before you can bring in the packages, he said. Whatever the scientific truth here is, Valet suspects that it may be knotted up with the secret of consciousness itself. The thing that philosophers call qualia, the conscious experience each human has, seems to be more than the sum of our physical parts. There's an unsolved X there. Valet's friend Federico Fagin, for one, argues that consciousness is a basic property of nature, that the dimensions we call space-time are in fact byproducts of some deeper reality. Maybe UFOs, Valet suggests, are that reality welling up into ours. When he read Mysterio Objet Celeste for the first time, as a teen, Valet wrote in his diary, I will probably die without seeing any solution to this immense problem. A decade later, after watching the moon landing, he copied down a line from Jung's alchemical studies, about how life's biggest problems can never be solved, but only outgrown. It's still a long way to a place like the Museum of the Laidler Meteorite in Normandy, where dark fragments of a proven reality rest, like truffles, under a glass dome.